medical records, um, which are near and dear to my heart, having to do with the registry. Um, what I'd like to do is kind of blow through the slides. I think we have an hour. Is that right, Mary? We have an hour, and what I'd rather do is take questions and suggestions. We got some really great suggestions um, two years ago about how other people did things. Um, so that was that's how I want to structure this. It's, it's very loose. Um, so medical records can be intimidating. Um, you know, just just getting through getting the appointment with the specialist, waiting in the waiting room, getting through the appointment, and then getting the results. The last thing you want to you the importance of organizing your medical records, how to get them if you, if you don't have them, um, and uh, why you should care about either. Um, so obviously we want to talk about the uh, collection of medical records to, to um, give to your primary physician so they know what the results of your test was or whatever. There's other places that this data can now be used. And um, I don't know how many of you all were in the, um, the meeting yesterday where we were talking about the registry and the PMS data network. Everybody? Okay. So if you weren't in that meeting, um, we were talking about a project that has been funded by almost a million dollars to our foundation, funded by PCORI, which is Patient-Centered Outcome um, Research Initiative. And it's over 18 months, and essentially um, we have a partner at Harvard who will be taking electronic health records that we collect from our families and doing his technology magic in the IT world and making sure everything stays locked up in private and building a search engine, essentially, that researchers can then go in. So they would see registry data, they would see these new electronic health records that we send them, and then we can add other layers of, of data. Um, so in the midst of building that, we will be collecting electronic health records from families. And so that's also another thing I want to you know, be a take away from this presentation. Um, I already told you this. Actually, I think there's a family in this room that could add like 10 more specialists to this slide. But, um, you yeah, know, we, in the first few years of our di child's diagnosis, often we see this many specialists or more. So this concept of thinking that your pediatrician is going to be the bus driver and have all this stuff, give it up, man. <laughs> You're driving the bus, and you have to get a copy of everything, and you have to keep it organized, and you have to give it to the next guy because nobody else is really looking after this. Um, some stuff gets sent to the pediatrician, some stuff doesn't, or your internist, depending on how old your child is. So, you know, there's a lot to coordinate here, and there's different ways that you can organize it. On top of the medical um, doctors, we're also seeing all sorts of different um, therapists, and we're paying out of pocket to see these therapists. And information may be needed, so we have to think about where that's going to be going to. And again, this isn't comprehensive. I'm sure there's there, there's more things that people are trying. Um, so. We're interacting with a lot of different physicians, and um, none of them really, except maybe your, your primary care physician, really knows your child. You know your child best. You know all the problems that they're having. You sense things when other people say, oh, it's no big deal. I mean, we see this anecdotally on Facebook all the time, where the mom just knows something's wrong. And so, you know, you're that messenger to all of those different specialists and physicians. And they don't have time. I mean, you know, they're, they're all making less money than they were 20 years ago, and they're trying to see more patients in a day, and, you know, they've got to do reports and do rounds. And so they're not stopping and calling the specialists and having nice long conversations about your child. Um, and, you know, if, if they say they're going to get a report to, to back to a primary care physician or specialist, they probably really think that they will. Somebody in their office needs to follow through, and we all know that that doesn't always happen. So again, you need to take responsibility, you need to be the driver, and make sure that, that 
you either get a physical copy of something or an electronic copy of something, and you have the master set. So uh, the other reason that you, I, I touched on earlier that you want to collect and organize your medical records is that now we have more and more studies. And for instance, um, Dr. Jimmy Holder from Baylor wants our EEG reports. Well, I can tell you, three years ago, I would have been like, I know she had one done because it was a horrible experience, but I have no idea where the report is. Well now, because I've organized my medical records, I'm like, I'll just flip to the seizure section and I'll just pull out my report and I'll just scan it and send it to them. And so now my child will be in, an e in a seizure study at Baylor University with very little burden on me because I finally sat down and organized my records. So there's all sorts of other studies that are either going on or coming up in our community. And, and there may be other things. That your child may have other um, conditions that are or aren't related to PMS that this foundation doesn't sponsor the study or, or it's not our researchers, but it's something else, you know, an autism study or something. And at some point, they're going to ask you questions and having your medical records is going to give more accurate information. Um, and I'll tell you, in the beginning, when either physicians, it was always physicians in the beginning, would ask me questions. When did she crawl? When did she walk? When did she make her first guttural sound? You know, I was traumatized by the parking lot, by dragging her in, changing the diaper in the waiting room. You finally get in to see this person that you've waited six months to see. You can't remember the questions that you had to ask them because they were so important and now they've completely lost. Your child is taking their clothes off and like licking the floor. And you know, it, it, it's not the best of circumstances to have a nice long chat with your physician um, and fill them in on everything. Um, so, you know, they're asking me things like, when did she do this and when did she do that? And, and I'm going, I don't know. Um, I think it was that Christmas at my mother-in-law's house and, you know, I, I, it's not good information for the medical record. But more importantly for me, it made me feel like a bad mom. Like, who doesn't know when their child started walking? Like, so finally, I mean, even the dentist asked me these questions. Every single doctor Shannon went to, and in the beginning you see a lot, they ask you the same questions, and if you can't answer them, you just feel like you're a bad caregiver. And the fact is, you're not. You're an excellent caregiver with a lot going on and so much information swirling around that you can't keep track of what day it is or what year or what month they, they met a milestone. So what I did is I went back to all of her therapy notes, all of the therapists that came to the house in the first few years. And I did this when she was three. I didn't do this over a 20-year period. And I went through and I found when she first started to bear weight, and I wrote down the date. And when she started to crawl, and I wrote down the date. And when the speech therapist said that she was chewing, or she made a guttural noise. And I stuck it all in a spreadsheet. And to this day, I was just at the NIH last month, and the psychiatrist said, so when did she, and I said, hold that thought, and I handed him the spreadsheet, and I said, it's all right there. Dates and age. And what I did is one column was the milestone, one column was the date, and, but the more important date was in the third column, which was what did it equate to? Eight months, 10 months, three years, 10 years. And it, it has been so much less painful to be able to hand that piece of paper over, feel good that these are accurate dates and I didn't guess wrong, than have to go through the constant questions. Because I, I'm assuming that even when Shannon's 20, she's gonna have a new doctor somewhere and they're gonna ask me these questions. I'm getting nods from moms that have kids that are like in their 20s. So, what about the annual paperwork? I am really lucky that I have a child in a great school. But the nurse asks me for the same stuff every year, and I have to update it or Shannon can't get off the bus in the morning. Then I've got this awesome hippotherapy for horseback riding that I have to pay out of pocket for. And they want to know her whole medical history every session. And then we've got swim therapy. And then we've got respite. Oh my gosh, respite is great. Do you know that we had this overnight respite in my area for a year? But we never did it because I dreaded the paperwork so much. And I finally had to do the paperwork, and now she can go away for a weekend and have the time of her life. But the mere thought of completing the paperwork, I was like, oh, forget it. I'd rather not have respite. I mean, that's pretty huge that I've become that averse to doing paperwork. And it's, it's always going to be this way. Our, we are always going to have to do annual paperwork. 
So some places have them online, some places don't. None of them have the same set, so you're still going to have to fill things out. Um, and there's also the insurance paperwork, which depending on what you have and what they cover, can be um, more or less arduous. Um, and then there's you know people move jobs, people move insurance, they have brand new doctors, and, and they have to get this information to them as well. So. Um, and here's the insurance, and you know they, they're always looking for proof of, of something or another. Um, and being organized, will, will, you'll be able to get back to them much faster. And again, I mean, I paid for things that I shouldn't have had to pay for because I just couldn't deal with having to dig out the paperwork that proved that I was right and they were wrong. This, I think, is the most important slide. If, if you know, we talk about nothing else today, is the empowerment. When you become the driver of your information, when you stop relying on your primary care physician and you become the person that owns that information, even if you don't understand every single report or every single lab, you have this empowerment. You can be an advocate like no other. And <laughs> the last probably three years that I've been going to medical appointments with my, my um, daughter, and I have a feeling this happens with, with you all too, Especially if it's a younger physician or a resident, they'll say, now what did you say you did? Are you a physician? I'm like, no, I just spend way too much time with you people. And, you know, I can talk the talk now because I've been in this world for so long and I understand it. It wasn't that way in the beginning. It was intimidating. I was like, this is their thing. I believe in whatever they say. And you can't do that forever. You have, at some point, you have to take the bull by the horns. And I'm telling you, once you get organized, and you can prove to them, they take you seriously. You know, if they said, well, how often does she have whatever, or how long has she been on this, and you can give accurate information, it's huge. I've also found that doctors who aren't taking new patients, I can weasel my way into their practice by impressing them with my knowledge and the, the, the background of what, what care my child has gotten. Um, I can also convince them to do things without me having to go in and sit in the waiting room. If I collect data on my child's sleep habits and say, you put her on X milligrams of trazodone, and I've logged her sleep patterns for the last month, and this is the trajectory, he might say, okay, I'll just call in a new prescription. Okay, how much of a win is that? You don't have to show up. I don't even care if the guy charges me for the email. I didn't have to go make the appointment. You know, deal with the waiting room, deal with sitting in the room in the back where you think you're going to see the doctor, but really that's not going to happen for another half an hour, and then getting out of the parking lot. So being organized can also save you a lot of time. And let's face it, when you're in the IEP, the more in control you seem to be of the information, the more control you have. You still don't act too crazy. Um, so I was surprised last time, two years ago when I did this, how many people didn't know they had access to their medical records or how to access their medical records? And anecdotally, we had one family that left this, went back home, and a couple weeks later wrote on Facebook, OMG, I went to medical records and got my records and found that when my child was in the NICU, they suspected a syndrome and never mentioned it to us. <laughs> HIPAA, I can't reveal who it was. <laughs> um, so, that's power. I mean, I think from that day on, that mother said, you know what, I'm not, I'm going to ask more questions before I leave doctor's offices. They are not, you know, and I am the daughter of a physician and a nurse, but they're people, they're not gods. So, we all know HIPAA, we've all been responsible for killing a number of trees, for the amount of paperwork that we've been handed for HIPAA. I just ask them to please, like, I sign it and then give it back to them. Um, but there's, HIPAA is a, it, was, it was established for a reason and it's very important and sometimes it can hinder progress, but it is what it is. And um, if you need background on it, you can, you can always you know, research it. But um, you know, the reason that we had a, a separator down the hall while Dr. Phelan and, and Dr. Bentecourt were discussing genetic reports is because of HIPAA. You can't have people talking about their personal medical information in a public space. So, you know, you may get HIPAA thrown in your face when you ask for something, and you're going to have to know a little bit more about what your rights are and what they are, and what 
what the rules of the physicians are as well. Um, so here, the second bullet says, make sure you fill out authorization for disclosure of protected health information before you're at your doctor's office. You know, we tend to we tend to just sign stuff, and you know, especially when we're with our kids and we just want to get through with it. But you know, until you can recognize what these forms are, you should read at least the first couple. First couple versions, so you know what you're signing and you realize, and, and you can ask them questions. Um, if you are can't get your medical records, and I can't speak well to this for our international families because there may be different rules. And if you're in a place where there's socialized medicine and you're not paying for your medical care, you may not have the same access to reports and medical records that, that people in the United States do. So, you know, I, I, this is my waiver. Um, so, you can you can contact the state medical board. You can contact insurance boards. I mean, don't take no for an answer. But you've got to be geared up that this is not going to be one phone call or one email to get something because somebody's going to have to go to some work to give you this information. Um, and then, you know, keep a record of what you're requesting and who you spoke to. I mean, we've all learned that trick. The first, as soon as somebody says, you know, Dr. So-and-so's office is Susie. Hi, Susie, this is Megan. How are you? You having a good day? Susie's name gets written down on the piece of paper and I write all my notes. And then when I call back a week later and say, you know, I talked to Susie last week and she said she was going to mail it, then you have somebody to hold accountable for it. And, you know, be nice at first. <laughs> it could get ugly later. Um, so and, uh, um, there's some people in this room that can speak to, speak to this anecdotally. Um, just if you can get a physical copy of your medical report from that day or when you're getting discharged or whatever, do it when you can, because they have it in their hand or they have it up on the screen. If you've got to go back a week later, or a month later, or five years later, it's going to be harder for them and they're going to put it off and you're never going to get what you need without really pushing for it. Um, you can also get, get things mailed out. Remember, you're probably going to be required to have a signature for a re release of medical information. Um, and you know, don't assume that just because you check the box that you want all your medical files released to your internist or your pediatrician, that that's going to get done. I don't know why it doesn't always get done, but my, my um, experience is that when I see the pediatrician say, hey, did you get the renal report? He flips through and he says, nope, the last thing I got was from 2011. I'm like, okay, well, you're a little out of the loop. Let me fill you in. Um, and then electronically. Um, and this is sticky, and I don't have all the answers to this. Um, I know a family that went to, they were in a great hospital system. It had a great electronic health records company. There's probably about 10 or 20 electronic health records vendors now. And Epic is the biggest, and it's, it's huge. And she was all excited. She's like, I'm going to get my electronic health records for this MSDN project. And her child, all of her child's doctors were at one medical center. So she's like, this is a no-brainer. They got back to her and sent her um, a list of the, the dates of his appointments and his vaccination schedule and said, he's over 14. Not 18, 14. And we can't provide that information without his permission. Well, we all know when that's going to happen. So, this was not something she expected. She thought this was going to be easy. And she was in a facility where this should have been attainable. I went to my pediatrician in a metropolitan area, lots of top doctors, and I said, hey, I'm the PI of this project, and I want to see how much space this is going to take up on a flash drive. So can you put all my daughter's medical records for the last 14 years on this flash drive? <laughs> Oh, sweetie, of course we could if we had an electronic health record contract, but we haven't even signed that yet, so we don't have electronic health record. And then she pointed to the three rolling walls of files, and she said, that's all we have. So I got to scan all that? So, you know, there's varying, the electronic health record space is new to all of us, and um, the rules seem to, seem to still be moving. Um, so this is the hard part, and I know some of you have already gone through this, and this is requiring uh, requesting your old medical records. And 
sometimes you have to physically find the medical records um, department in hospitals. And I don't know if you, has anybody ever tried to do that? They're buried. The only place it's harder to find is the billing office because those places are off premise because they know that we would go in there and like, you know, firebomb them. So the billing office is definitely not at the hospital. The medical records office is at the hospital, but it's not well labeled because they don't want you to come in and talk to them. Um, it's much easier to say, no, we can't do that on the phone or in an email. Did you have a question? My able-bodied uh, moderator. Uh -huh. I had a question about the fees. Just to request uh, Oliver's, just his hospital records, not his specialists from 2012. They sent us a bill for $900. So here, here's an interesting factoid I didn't know until we were collecting medical records for Stanford. If the parent, who by the way has already either paid or their insurance has paid for this medical um, appointment, if the parent requests it, often there is a fee. If the researcher or another institution or another doctor requests it, free. It's not fair, but that's my experience. So I think the trick, and I'd have to talk to a few more people about this, I'm not going to be saying this is the right way, is, is you have to have the request come from the doctor. And I'm getting nods from somebody in front. And you see so, the so it's free if the person who, if, if the person isn't the one that paid for it originally. So you got to pay for it twice. Ashley, did you ask personally or you asked it? I asked not to the doctor didn't ask that. Um, and you know, I, I I know that at my doctor's office, it's 10 to $25 for a camp form or a back to school form. I can't imagine what your son's medical records, I mean, it had to have been reams of paper, so I'm almost surprised it was only $900, but I wouldn't have paid it. But if you're we desperate, stopped, you have to. I stopped to. getting them because the doctor's offices are also now charging, um, so we just can't, I mean, it's, it's huge. So. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. <laughs> They're wearing us down. That that's not right, you know. And you you've already paid for that information, and you deserve to have it. So I I would say that somebody you need to have a conversation with somebody calmly, quietly, and politely to start. Possibly bring bakos and um, explain to them the situation, and that you are the primary caregiver, and you are the keeper of the medical records, and that this is a um, very rare condition and that this is not up for debate, and that the next call will come from your lawyer. And do you have somebody that you went to like college with or something that has like a lawyer after you? You? Yeah. So have him make the initial call, and then you call back with your main thing. Megan, is it, is it, do you think it's subjective? Lady in the back, could you wait until the microphone yeah, yeah, comes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, There's always a convenience. Uh, do you think it's subjective that it, depends on the doctor, or is it a legal thing for... My pediatrician waives my fees because he likes me. But okay. I have a couple of other so doctors that probably would subjective. charge me double. Okay. <laughs> no, so she could fight it in, in a different way. I didn't know if there was any, like, go to your congressman type of necessity there, or it's just subjective. This is where, um, and I don't know if Andrew's still in the room, this is where I am not well versed in the state-by-state -state yeah, rules and things. Okay. Have a question. And have a question. So, is this, what, what, repeat the question, Megan. So, so families can often get charged for getting their records, but if a, if, a, if a researcher or a physician requests the records, there's no fee. And so they went to get their child's medical records, so it was a $900 fee, because there's a lot of records. So they've stopped asking for it, which means they don't have access to the, their child's medical records which, oh, by the way, they already paid for their appointment, or their insurance company did. So Sue's question was, is it arbitrary? And I'm saying, I don't know what if there's state laws or federal laws. Um, I just know that medical offices, I and mean, it's kind of like the airport, the airplane's charging you for bags, and then for pillows, and then for peanuts, and then for the bathroom. They're trying to stay above board, and, and that's what doctor's offices are doing. I mean, they're hardly keeping themselves up over the, so a, a lot has changed in the medical environment over the past few years, so I'm, I'm, I'm giving this to the best extent of my current knowledge right now. 
Um, there is no requirement that a doctor would charge you a fee for your records. There's no, there's no requirement that they need to charge you a fee. That fee is associated with the processing, associated with it. So I, I, from a business standpoint, you can understand if you're talking about printing or transferring hundreds of pages of records, if you're talking about um, putting that in different media formats, so if you're talking about sharing it outside of a paper way, um, you're talking about staff time and otherwise, that you could understand in some realm of reality, some, some realm of reality, you could understand and justify the office processing fee, because that's really what this at its core is, is an office processing fee associated with the production of this record. So you can understand that, and if they waive it, so I'm, I'm just giving the business, the business argument for the association fee. I have never in my life, and I have worked in rare disease for, uh, for 10 years now, um, I have never in my life heard of $900 um, as an office processing fee for accidental records. It was a hospital. Um, there, there is, so some of the external, and I don't want to take up too much more time, and I'm happy to chat with you separately. Um, some of the fees, um, some offices will not release medical records to you unless they are typed up. Um, and so some of them are handwritten. Some of these records are handwritten depending upon the, the individual that you're seeing. And so sometimes it's time that they need to actually type them up. Um, there's, there's different, it needs to be in a certain state of quality checking as well um, for, for the hospital's liability or the medical provider's liability as well. So there's a whole process associated with it. That's often why when you request a record, you can't get it on the spot. You have to come back, and often in person, to get it. Um, so that's that's the longish, shortish, medium-ish answer. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to so chat about Ashley, it. So Ashley, after you got a year's worth of records for $900, do you now say, OK. So do you now say when you're leaving the hospital, leaving a doctor's office, can I have the report now? I think I need to come to the Oh, I'm sorry. The people that are watching this on the stream, sorry. Um, I said that uh, we didn't pick up the medical records because they were $900, and now um, we can't get them at the appointment anymore at the hospital when we leave the hospital and discharge or um, at the appointment because they say HIPAA this year has changed and they can't do that. Anymore. Okay. Um, I'm going to give the microphone to the nice lady in front of you when I've done this slide because she works in a doctor's office. Maybe you might want to let Okay. So the question is, Mary, are they just saying that to make her go away? Is it working? That doesn't make sense. I mean, HIPAA, when I replaced, asked for records, and all they want is like an additional signature because they say, hey, well, we can't release it to your husband, we can't release it to your sister, and, and, and they, they, they say, oh, we'll send it to you if you get a signature. But HIPAA should stand in the way as long as they have the appropriate permission for you to get your records. Okay, so Ashley, I think this is, I think we need to think out of the box on this, and we need to figure out a strategy, and then we need to use that to coach families down the road when they have the same problem. Because why well, reinvent the wheel? So um, we'll correspond about that. So how can we organize medical records once we do get them? So that is my daughter's um, medical record that I worked on until 2 a.m. the night before I had to go to the NIH study. Because even though I knew for six months I had the appointment, I just couldn't deal with the thought of going through the boxes in the basement that had all of her reports. But isn't it beautiful? <laughs> and uh, I meant to put a soda can next to that to show you that it's really a, quite a big binder. And it became kind of the laugh at um, NIH because they had it for about a month. And they're like, oh, yeah, you're the binder lady. <laughs> like, yes, I am. Um, but it was great because they would ask me something over, I mean, I went, you we were at NIH every couple weeks for a few months because... Um, they have this free clinic now for our PMS families, and my daughter was one of the first ones seen, and they were trying to figure out what protocol to use. So we were there frequently, and I would see lots and lots of specialists, probably 10, and every one of them would ask me a question. I'd say, let me flip to that section of my binder. And it was very empowering. I'm feeling very good about myself, which is it's a good thing. Um, so how you do your binder, if you are a paper person, and all you younger people probably are like, binder, what's a binder? <laughs> um, 
how you organize it up to you. Some people are just like the most recent on top, keep it simple. Um, this is how I do mine. Note how, how I now have added tabs that are handwritten. It's not that neat anymore. Um, but I'm not going to tell you how you should organize your stuff. It's how your brain works. Whatever makes sense to you, that's how you should organize it. Um, it, it doesn't have to make sense to anybody else. You're the one that's got to make the copy and free hole punch it and put it in the binder. So do it how it makes sense to you. Color code it, I don't care. Just do it. Um, and so um, the other thing that, you know, our younger attendees would be like, binder, electronically. And you can do this. Um, the, the great thing about organizing all the stuff electronically is a lot of people have printers that are scanners now. Um, or they take pictures of things with their phones, which I never think to do. Um, and you can put it on a flash drive. So when your spouse gets moved to another state and you have a whole new team of doctors, you can just walk in and say, here's my kid on a flash drive. And it's there. Um, you know, so there's a lot of advantage to doing it electronically, but I had all the paperwork and by God, I was going to get it in a binder, so that's how I did it. Um, and there's different tools. I've Googled this. I'm not going to tell you which one's the best one because I don't know. But there are free tools and there are services that you can pay for. Um, and um, like I said, you might be a scanner. And don't think you're going to go to Kinko's and scan this stuff. It's a, that's a very expensive option. Um, so the person that helped me with my slides made this nice little screenshot of how, you know, you could, this would be just have a different file for each year, or you have a different file for each doctor. Whatever makes sense for you, because you know what? If this is a really detailed way of organizing your stuff, and it's super convoluted, what you will have is an empty binder with a huge set of piles of stuff that you're going to put in the binder, and it'll never get done. So make it easy on yourself. Um, Dropbox, Google Drive, Box.net, these are our other share, uh, document sharing things that you can also look into. Um, these are some of the websites. I know that caresync.com, I have a friend who uses this. You actually, um, actually, <laughs> we might want to investigate this for you. You actually pay a flat fee of, I think, $100 to Caresync. And Caresync then solicits all your providers for all your medical records and what's not electronic they put on to electronic. They also have a monthly fee to maintain services after that and I don't think you have to do the monthly fee, I think you can do the one time thing. But I'm waving myself right now of any like specific information about CareSync or Microsoft Health Vault or any of these. I'm gonna, you gotta research this stuff on your own and figure out what works for you and what works for your checkbook and all of that. But there are tools that exist. I'm just saying, don't make this harder on yourself than it has to be. CareSync is one of the ones that may actually go get your records for you, and this is all they do for a living, so they know how to get around silly arguments. So tips. How am I on time? Okay. I, I really want more questions and, and um, discussion. So we got some great organizing ideas two years ago, so I want to kind of cruise through these. Um, so. I've gotten really good about this because my daughter's medications are changing for seizures every couple of months and I can't remember everything by memory anymore. So always have an updated list of medications, the dosages and the reason. Your child may be taking one, a, a drug for one reason, but if somebody sees it, it's for something completely different. So keep, it, it can be in a spreadsheet, it can be in a Microsoft document, it can be on the back of your, you know, visa bill, I don't care. But, but you should really, I keep it on the computer and I change the day that the, the prescription gets changed. And you'd be surprised at how often I have to print that out and hand it to a, a teacher or a babysitter. Um, I mean, I'm here without my child. I left a lot of paperwork on the bulletin board for my husband in the event that he had to know anything. Um, I already said this part, however you're going to do it, keep it simple. Don't come up with some super convoluted way of, of organizing them. You'll never do it. Um, that's a challenge. Um, something's better than nothing, you know. If your child's 27, don't start with the neonatal records. Start with the past year. And if that doesn't kill you, then go back a couple more. But at least you have the most recent information, okay? Don't make it harder than it has to be. Um, this is probably more for, for young people. I, I stopped wanting my husband or, you know, 
your spouse, to take a day off of work to go to doctor's appointments. We were burning through vacation time for something that wasn't fun. But, as I you know, illustrated before, when you're holding on to your child and trying to get them to stop licking the window and they're taking off their clothes, you can't write notes. So, if you can find a friend, um, or an aunt, or an uncle, or a brother, or a sister, or, or a babysitter, or somebody that can accompany you to the doctor's office, and when you're finished with the exam, take the child out for a walk to the elevators or whatever, and you can have a quiet moment with the doctor to write down what he said. Or, um, if, if you don't think that you're going to understand the information, and you have a friend that's a nurse or something like that, you can bring them along. Um, I did that a couple times in the beginning, and I had a friend who was a nurse who was absolutely appalled at how this resident treated him. I didn't know any better. Um, so, you know, if you can, I mean, sometimes both parents want to be there. We have a family that's, who are awesome, and they've divided the um, doctor's offices up by systems, organs. So he does eyes, teeth, and feet. <laughs> and she doesn't. So if the kids, and then that's how they both work, and they both track their own medical records and you know all that stuff. And so he goes to some specialists and see she goes to some specialists. And that way they can know their area of expertise. I think it was ingenious, never done it. Uh, I also don't pay check, so it wasn't like I was losing any money by not going to work that day. Um, so this just amazed me, and this happened like in my first pregnancy. You for, for two months you have this burning question, you must ask the doctor. You get in there, and we've already discussed. You gotta get through the parking lot, and pick the kid up, and then you drop the baby bag, then you get in the waiting room, and everybody's giving you the dirty look, and then you've got the stinky diaper, and now they're really ticked off at you, and then the cranky lady behind the desk, you get in there, you finally see the doctor. You're sweating, you just wanna get out. And you get back in the car, and you're like, oh my god. <laughs> I didn't ask the three questions I came in, and I can't get another appointment for another year. So have a running list. Is it on your desktop? Is, if it's on, it's on your handwritten calendar? Whatever system works for you. Have a running list of things that you want to ask. And they may not be burning questions, but you know, the last time I saw, saw Shannon's psychiatrist who manages her sleep meds and her ADD meds, I mentioned to him that we were seeing a new neurologist. And he said, do me a favor and ask him this. And I said, is it critical? And he said, no. Next time you go in, well, I'm not going in for another four months. So that question needed to be put someplace. So I was like, okay, where can I went to my Google Calendar on the day of that appointment. I said, question about, you know, whatever. Dosage for, and so whatever works for you, but don't rely on your memory because in stressful situations, it's worthless. I mean, at least for me it is. Um, so our pharmacy changed their policy. Um, I used to be able to go into the pharmacy and say, can you send me, a, can you print out a list of all the drugs that we've gotten for my whole family or just for this child in the past year? It helped me make sure that I was getting reimbursed for, for insurance. Um, and I think we were going into some study and I wanted to make sure that I didn't forget any of the meds. Because again, you can't remember every dosage and every med that kids are on. The last time I went in there, I was asking for it on behalf of my mother-in-law, and they said she would have to sign something, which is understandable. Um, but I had to move all of her prescriptions over to Scripps, which is mail order, and I had to make sure that I didn't leave anything out. So, you know, the pharmacies all have home computers. They have ways of tracking these things. So leverage them if you need that. Um, again, you got to be nice. Don't go on a you know, Saturday 15 minutes before the pharmacy closes. Um, Again, if you need something in the doctor's office, indicate that it's urgent, be nice about it, um, and also don't wait till the last minute. Okay, don't write these down, but <laughs> I can send you the slides if you want, but this is the kind of thing that came up when you Googled, you know, organizing health records. Cincinnati Children's has a great thing. There's the, um, there's a mommy site for, for um, kids that are, are medically fragile. There's all sorts of tools. A lot of this stuff is, is handwritten forms, but it's, a lot of it's going to electronic. I can't emphasize this enough. Just start from here going forward. You don't even have to go back. Just start getting organized now. It'll make you feel better. It'll make you feel smart. It'll make you feel like you're the best advocate for your child. And it will make being, being part of research and other things just easier. But, 
the takeaway here isn't, I want you to do this for research. The takeaway is, as much as we'd like somebody else to be in charge of this, they're not going to be. It's our responsibility, it's our job, and we've got to do it. And this is my new favorite saying, don't let perfect get, be the enemy of the good. Something's better than nothing. <laughs> okay? So, um, you know, just get started. Now, this was my favorite part last time, which was suggestions, questions, and I'm going to start with a suggestion that was made last time by a parent of an adult. And we were talking about how, you know, you can't remember. I mean, this is pre-internet and computers and cell phones and digital pictures. And somebody says, you know, when did she start walking? You're like, I don't know. Well, they said go through photographs. And um, <laughs> I think you said Christmas pictures. You're like, that was the year we had this. <laughs> That, that was the year that we had the you know, tree over in the corner, and there's a little date stamp at the bottom. You remember, she was standing up and she pulled. There's a lot of things that can trigger your mind. Which house were you living in? Did you, was it the year you had to have your mother-in-law over? Whatever. But little things like that. It's not just, you may be able to dig out more than you think. Um, but I find that guesstimates is not great. And, and this is... Parent memory is something that, that came to light um, to me when I heard some things about, um, I go to a lot of meetings in the autism space as well as the rare disease space. And I said to somebody very naively one time, I don't understand why this whole vaccine theory got so much traction. And, and they said, well, parents were anecdotally, I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but this was the part that I took away with. Parents were anecdotally saying, we went for the two year checkup and the next day he stopped whatever. But when they went back and looked at school reports, six months before that, the child teacher had reported that the child had regressed. But in the parents' memory, once they read this article about vaccinations, it was the day they left the office, or the week they left the office. And I'm not faulting the parent for it. It's just that we can't remember that, for one thing, you're sleep deprived. And if you have multiple children, well, I mean, who knows? My mother didn't know my name until everybody moved out. So, you know, try and, um, try and document what you can. And, and I'm telling you, that the therapy note thing was born after three years of feeling like I don't know my child. And I knew my child better than anybody. I just can't remember when they did all these milestones. The answer is late, really, really late. But that didn't really seem to suffice for the doctors. OK, questions? And if you guys can just wait for the microphone to come to you. Um. Sure thing. Um, so my question is, right now my son is in uh, preschool, and it, we just let the therapists there do all of his out-of-home therapy, you know? And I don't have copies of those notes. Do I need to go and request copies of those therapy notes? You don't have patient? to have all the notes, but, but I want you to start thinking a certain way. Who paid for that therapy? Your insurance or you? The school well, system. it's through the school, so our taxes did. Okay, so indirectly you paid for it. Right, yeah. So I wouldn't go marching in there and say, I want my therapy notes and I want it yesterday. What I would say is, my provider, my, my physician has asked for records. I don't need it tomorrow, but what can I do to facilitate getting copies of all that? And they may say, here's a stack, go stand in the school office and copy them yourself. I don't know what the answer is going to be. but. You absolutely have the right to those notes. Who are they writing the notes for? I mean, they do it because they have to. My sister's a speech pathologist. You have a, a twenty, you have a thirty-minute appointment, so twenty minutes or fifteen minutes you're with the kid. Then you write your report. Then you meet with the mom and hand off the homework. But what? Where does that report go? Yeah, it's just in a binder at the school. Yeah, you, and and I think that it's very reasonable for you to say, I would like copies of. And if they question why, I think you have a very good reason for that. Um, and, you know, it, they should be excited that somebody's going to read the report. <laughs> they sat there and wrote it. Um, and they hate writing reports. Ask anybody in the audience that has to write reports. Okay, questions? I'm sorry, you already asked a question you can't ask anyone. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to mention something that's really helped us. Um, if, so our son has, um, his main issue is GI related, and the pediatrician recommended that we did this. It never occurred to me previously, but it's been so helpful. 
we drafted a summary letter of, um, of basically his GI story and where he is today, and we sent it to the GI doctor, and they rewrote it and um, you know put in medical language. Wow! But it's five pages, and it's just um, you know an overall summary, and they signed it, and so it's you know official medical. Because they know so much, it means more from them than it comes from you. Right. Exactly. And uh, so now when we approach specialists and different motility clinics and different people, they just look at that summary letter rather than having to dig through. Well, it didn't come from the crazy mom. It came from the doctor. <laughs> so that's been really, really helpful, and the specialists have really appreciated that we did that, so they can just really quickly get to what his issue is. I bet they didn't charge you for that, did they? No. no. That probably took a lot more time. No. <laughs> That's a great idea. Um, a couple of other miscellaneous things I didn't say to you. Every time I go leave my kids, typical or PMS, um, if, if both parents are leaving, make sure you leave a letter of um, medical permission. You know, to whom it may concern, the following 10 people in the neighborhood and my mother-in-law have permission to seek medical care for my child. The one time I forgot to print it out, she almost got stitches. I'm sure she would have gotten them, but I'm sure it would have been a little bit more of a nightmare in the ER. Um, the other thing I already told you, always keep an updated list of, your, um, of the meds they're on, the dosage, and why. And I don't want to promise anything that, that, that may not come to fruition, but as we get farther, as, as this disease area gets farther into clinical trials and dealing with pharmaceutical companies and things like that in the future, they're going to want to know what medical drug histories patients have been on. Um, so, you know, if you ever think you're going to be involved in any sort of study like that, you know, this is the kind of thing where it'll be a lot easier if you can get, get start collecting this information now. Um, and um, it's also, when you're doing those, those annual reports, it's just easier. Okay, so we have 10 minutes. Um, Oh, um, I just had like a little filing tip. As you said, you know, everybody's system is their own and what's best for one person. Um, I work in a field where we had to collect and save a lot of images. Um, and somewhere along the line, someone had a system that really worked for me. And um, I've employed that when I've scanned my medical records and I think it works. And um, we put like, if I was, if I had a medical record for today, I would save the file as 140725, like with a space between. So it's 2014, the month and the year. And I just found that, like, in going going back, like you know, when you click list on your computer and stuff, that everything lines itself up by date automatically. That. So the gist of that is, put the year before you put the month. Put the year first so it lines up by year right. and then obviously like you have if it's a single digit um month you have to put a zero in front or you know 11 will sometimes come ahead of january whatever um but yeah so it's six digits two for the year and then a space and then four for the That's great. um this is unrelated but i will tell you while the microphone is moving I know that my daughter's had two MRIs, and it was back before you got a CD. No idea where the films are. I know that I took them away from the doctor because they couldn't find it the first two times I called. And I said, I'm going to be responsible for this. And I know I marched it to the endocrinologist at one point, and he's retired. I don't know if I left it there, but I've looked under every bed and every couch where an MRI film could fit, and, and they're, they're gone. And, you know. When NIH or somebody says, oh, I'd love to see them as a baseline. I'm like, yeah, I would too. I have no idea where they are. And Susie Q at the doctor's office is the only one, you know. So um, even big things are hard. Hi. Um, a couple of hints that I've done over the years. My daughter's 36. So um, going to different university hospitals where they start asking, what age did they do this? What age? I finally typed up one-liners, and I included in that first um, seizures, first these meds, this, and they love that. And it's just a, this date, this happened. This date, you know, the summary of the things they always ask you. Um, also, I've kept all the notebooks that went back and forth to school since she was three. 
those are another place where I find a lot of stuff I forgot, things she did or didn't do or lost. So they're helpful. I didn't touch on the school records, but because I'm a little OCD and like to be organized, I kept all of her correspondence, both email, but a lot of the binder stuff. And it was back when I loved the teachers and the school system and all that, and that changed drastically one day, and I had to call a lawyer. And within a week of hiring the lawyer, I was able to have a photocopy of every IEP in order, and then I went through and found the correspondence where things had been promised but not delivered or said, that really weren't said, and private placement in a private school 12 months of the year within three, three months and we never had to go to a courtroom. So, saving stuff. Okay, five minutes. I have a question for you. Um, I also have some videos that were made over the years for different doctors of what might have been seizures or the screaming behaviors. When I'm doing the file, the medical records file for um, Selma and German, um, are those something that should be attached in that file? Um, I don't think so, and, and the reason I'm saying don't give me everything is because video and images take up a lot of memory, and, and that could provide us some images, but I will pass that question on. Um, okay. Um, I just wonder if you have any tips for Jake is 20. Uh, shortly after he was diagnosed in the first four years of his life, we were in four different states, and to, to get records, or, and it may be, people who have stayed in the same place but your health plan was sold or the hospital has merged or you know become another system are there any tips for delving into that and, and getting records that way anybody anybody um, I've always lived in one place and I requested Shannon for on behalf of a doctor that was publishing on her so I got her neonatal records probably by the time she was four so I have not faced that situation personally. Um, you know, in the future we're not going to have as much of that because of electronic health records, but I, I do think that you're going to have a challenge, especially with retired people and, um, and health plans changing. But um, I can try and, you know, problem solve that with you. It might be something CareSync, or, or, and the CareSync's not the only service out there, and I'm not encouraging you to go out and spend money to do CareSync, but, but yeah, Google CareSync and see what kind of, what they offer. Don't give any of your credit card yet. Um, uh, there's somebody back there with a, a microphone. Just something that we found helpful, Parker had a lot of medical records, especially in her, his first five years, is when you walk into a doctor's office and you see a sign that says we charge a dollar per page with a maximum of $25. We would request that that doctor would request all of the medical records and then promptly a month later would request all of the medical records from them, knowing that they capped their charge on the medical records. <laughs> because our neurologist had an outrageous price for our stuff, but the pediatrician didn't, and so we had them request everything and then promptly turned around and requested everything from them in writing. Um, and that kept all of our charges substantially below $900. <laughs> so if you ever see them with a sign in the office, there are always good doctors to request that they get all of your medical records. Um, That's a great idea. Just be a little bit sneaky. I was gonna say you're kind of sneaky. Um, so I, 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 I'm just gonna say that it, it is kind of difficult to try to get all the uh, the records, especially if you move around a lot. I know in my particular job, I moved uh, like four times within the last uh, relocated with the company within the last like ten years. So every time before we move, we make sure that we actually communicate with all the doctors and get all the records at that particular point before we move. Because otherwise, it's very, very, very difficult. Yeah, as Geraldine said, in theory, this country wants to have something called Blue Button. And right now, the Veterans Administration is the one that has come up with it, and the only ones that are using it, um, where military families can actually authorize that their medical records be shared with other providers. And after Katrina, when a lot of people relocated to Texas, it was only the vets that were getting, like, had decent medical <laughs> records because of this blue button. But, but I don't think that's going to happen in the near future. I mean, that's a few years away. Um, am I getting the axe? No. Oh, four minutes. Okay, so. 
All right, um, just a tip if you're using cloud storage or third party storage, anything like Google Drive or Dropbox, don't use that as your primary because the reality of those things is that you do not control the data once it's uploaded there and it also might not be secure. Uh, so anything can happen and things do happen. And that's a perfect segue to tell you that um, we are very careful about where the registry data is and how it's accessed and how it's de-identified and um, we will be extremely careful with the medical records that we receive um, that will go into the PMSDN project um, at the Harvard site and we have a lot of controls in place and people institutional review boards that watch over this kind of thing so nothing will be done willy-nilly this is this is very important and very private information and we have laws to live by so this is not something done haphazardly and I want everybody to be comfortable with that and if you aren't, ask me questions. Um, as far as requesting meds from the pharmacy, do they just give you a list of the meds or do they tell you what it's for? I don't know. When I got this report a few years ago, and again, I see the pharmacists more than I see my husband. I mean, <laughs> we're in there all the time. Like, so I said, can you run this report for my insurance? Because I think it was the Flex Fund. And I wanted to see what insurance I had to pay for so I could submit it to the Flex Fund. And they just said, yeah, do you have a few minutes? And they printed it out. And it was date, amount, dosage. It wouldn't have had the reason because I knew the reason. And I don't think they had the instructions. Um, but but it had what they would have had, some of the information that would have gotten the label. Sue, so I'm not the one that's not giving you the... the I, just uh, okay. say, uh, Sue, I just want to say one thing. When, when I did the Stanford study, we went back to get the uh, OB records and some of the NEO records, and they had trashed them. They were gone. So I'm just saying that this is great to get to start doing it, because someday you're going to try and find records and they're not going to be there. Right. My question was going to be, is that for purposes of the PMS DM project, can, and this is something you may or may not look like, can you provide a letter or something official that can be turned over to the families that they can use in requesting the data from their practitioner, you know, from their That answer will system. come from Andrea, who's in the green polka dot. In the green polka dot. Um, so we, we have talked about um, crafting a letter, and we also talked about a process around, um, so with the Stanford study, for example, that was a process where we um, actually gave the parents a letter that they could go to their physician and give that letter to their physician's office, and then the records would be sent directly to the foundation, as opposed to sort of the family being what could be thought of as like a go-between, the, the messenger, but not the recipient. Um, so we could, and we could absolutely provide families with a letter that said, you know, I'm requesting this information um, as a part of participation in um, a project to, you know, advance knowledge about PMS and about, um, on behalf of my community and also for the benefit of my family to have these records. Um, I'm, so we could provide you a letter like that, absolutely. Um, and uh, Jackie, our family um, engagement specialist, is um, very much, she's um, helping, working through some FAQs and some other processes, uh, and definitely will be guided and informed, we'll share everything that we've heard here, um, will be guided and informed by that as well. Um, so we can think about that, I think that's a really good, I think that's a, a really uh, good idea. The, the main core element though is that we don't want you to be cut out of the process. It's very critical that you, for all the reasons that Megan has described over this session, that you be the one who has the records and you are allowing us to have a copy of those records. That's what's really um, critical to your participation in this project and that this is a resource for you in the community. It is not for a resource for Harvard or for the foundation. It's, it's for you. So uh, we can provide you a letter, but it's, it will not make you, it will not make your doctor just send stuff directly to us because we still want it to go to you, if that makes sense. Okay, I, can, I don't want to bleed into the next session, so I can take yeah. questions out in the hallway or later this weekend if you want. Um, and thank you for your great questions and suggestions um, and your interest and 80 people have reconsented. Who in this room have not reconsented? Come on. Okay. All right. How about this? Yay for the 80 people that reconsented. The rest of you is left, left.
left and a third left because we're around a corner today.